You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. We're super excited to be able to discover, uh, really confirm the discovery of a new major mineralized zone at the Van Target. We have posited for quite some time that the exploration potential we see, not just at Van, but at some of these other targets within Descartes, has the potential to, uh, you know, where we have the potential to delineate nickel tonnage to define a multi-generational deposit that could ultimately rival a place like Sudbury in terms of how well it's known globally for being a center of global nickel mining. Welcome back to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers. And in today's show, we're gonna be profiling a new nickel discovery. Now, this is a nickel discovery that we told you could happen back in February when we first spoke to Martin Turen. He is the president and CEO of F FPX Nickel, one of our sponsors. And we talked about the Baptiste deposit, which is a PEA stage uh, project in British Columbia. But we also told you and brought to your attention the Van Target which on the footprint, it looks bigger than Baptiste and the surface grades looked better than Baptiste. Well, the first two holes were poked into that potential deposit and we've seen what's in the third dimension, at least thus far, and Martin's here to tell us about it. So Martin, welcome back onto the program. Uh, congratulations and break down these new drill results for us. Thanks, Bill. Always good to chat. Yeah, we're super excited to be able to discover uh, really confirm the discovery of a new major mineralized zone at the van target as you said these results are the first that confirm that third dimension so we had great uh, samples of outcropping bedrock so that's bedrock coming right to the surface that allowed us to vector in on this area of the property as a target and now these first two holes have confirmed long intercepts of mineralization importantly that mineralization is higher grade nearer surface than what we see typically at Baptiste. Um, so we're super excited about that. You know, Van Hole 1's, the first hole in the history of Van, intersected uh, 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 an area of over 100 meters of mineralization with uh, magnetically recoverable nickel grades in excess of 0.15%. That is about 25% higher grade than the overall resource uh, at Baptiste. And that intercept occurs very near surface. So much of the mineralization, the higher grade mineralization at Baptiste is in the lower portion of the deposit, is deeper underground. So to see that higher grade, higher up near surface at Van is, is a potential game changer for us. So you've put out two holes, there's seven holes pending, uh, but talk to us some more and remind us about the mineral mineralization here. You're, you can be confident even though it's only two holes because why? Yeah, so the nickel here is hosted in a mineral called awarowite, and awarowite deposits are known for their relative homogeneous, uh, consistently disseminated distribution of mineralization across very large areas. Okay, so what we see at Baptiste is an area that's approximately two kilometers of strike by one kilometer width to depths of around 400 or four to 500 meters vertically from surface. And you have a big consistent ore body there of consistent di dissemination of mineralization over that huge area. Just to give you a sense of that, that the, the area of that is around the size of Central Park and the depths are almost the height of the Empire State Building, just to give you a sense of that huge volume of nickel ore. And we see the same thing potentially forming here in the third dimension at Van where um, um, you've got long intercepts on two holes, yes, which is obviously a limited number of holes, but they're spaced 350 meters apart. The rest of the holes here all have around 350 meters spacing. So once we're through re releasing the results of all nine holes, we hope to be able to demonstrate that we've delineated a very large area here, something that starts to uh, uh, become at least comparable to Baptiste in its, in its, in its scale. That's obviously pending the assays of the remaining holes from this program. We've talked in the past how I'm going to say this as a compliment. You're a penny pincher. OK, so this was a very economic uh, drill program to discover this, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, you get a lot of bang for your buck from meterage when you drill this style of disseminated homogeneous mineralization. You know, nine holes is not a lot of holes. As I just mentioned, it's going to allow us to potentially delineate a very large area of mineralization. And, and why not spend more this year? It's really because um, this, was, this is really kind of an add-on uh, to what we already see at Baptiste. Baptiste is already the third largest undeveloped nickel deposit in the world. 
The scoping study that we did on the deposit last year showed it's one has the potential to be one of the lowest cost, largest nickel mines in 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 production. So the main focus of our company has been on moving Baptiste forward into the preliminary feasibility study phase. But we did set set aside a little bit of money to see what we have at Van, which is located about six kilometers away from Baptiste. And the hope here is not just to add tons, but to add higher grade tons near near surface. And that on the basis of at least the first two holes is is what we appear to have done here. And then when will should we expect the uh, final seven holes? Yeah, we'll probably be releasing those again in batches uh, over the coming weeks. So through the latter part of October into November, uh, investors can expect to see what the step outs from these first two holes look like. Again, over that over an area that covers uh, quite a large expanse, something in the range of a kilometer to a kilometer and a half uh, long by approximately a kilometer wide. So Baptiste is the third largest undeveloped nickel deposit in the world. Yet your market cap is 93, 94 million Canadian as we chat. What is a n- true nickel discovery in the market valued at right now? If Baptiste is only valued at 93, which you've argued in the past on this show that it's undervalued, but throw yeah. Baptiste out. If this is a true nickel discovery at the Van Target, what valuation might we see? Yeah, I, I really do believe that if this was uh, two new holes in a new target for a new nickel junior that had nothing else in its back pocket, you, this is something that could yield a valuation equivalent to what FPX already has, something in the range of 50 to $100 million. Um, and so we hope that the market kind of does not overlook the fact that this is a brand new discovery. It's something that could be standalone. It, it's, it stands apart from Baptiste, but ultimately could form part of a of a combined operation, uh, but brand new discoveries um, in, in a, if, if this was in a brand new company, absolutely we see it's something that could 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 easily yield valuation in the fifty to hundred million dollar range. As you know, as the uh, chief executive, investors judge you on a per share basis. How much value do you create yeah. for them on a per share basis? So now you have this second target, the van target, in addition to the deposit you've been working on. How are you going to monetize this? Can you share a little bit about your executive philosophy of how you might monetize this for shareholders' benefit? Yeah, well, first and foremost, the management and board here at FPX, we are, we are managers, of course, but we are shareholders. We own just about 19% of the company. So accreting uh, the value of the company on a per share basis is first and foremost in our minds out of pure selfish interest, if nothing else. How are we going to advance you know, Van and what, what does that look like? You know, first of all, we can't get too far ahead of ourselves. Let's see what the remaining holes look like. Let's see what this deposit looks like, uh, if it is indeed a deposit. And um, uh, what we have at Baptiste is we know we have a steady path ahead of us to de-risk that asset towards uh, feasibility work through permitting and to an, uh, ultimately a final investment decision. Now you kind of have the happy problem, I guess, um, that we may, you know, be on the verge of, of of being able to confirm that we've got another major nickel deposit that's six six kilometers north that's also under a hundred percent control. Now, does that mean that it gets developed as a standalone, separate and apart from Baptiste, or does it get developed before Baptiste because it's potentially better? or in combination with Baptiste in some type of form, that's really down to the, you know, the mining engineers and the development specialists to kind of work all of that out. Um, um, and it's, as I said, it's kind of a happy problem to have if you've got, uh, if you thought you had a, a world-class deposit already, and then you've got another one on your hands, it's, it's something that we'll happily deal with in, 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 in the months and the years to come. I guess part of what's behind my question, Martin, when I asked that in reading the press release is, you know, some executives uh, try to create as much value for shareholders via a spin out. But in this case, mm. just my own thinking is if you can show that you have a district, obviously you have two deposits and then perhaps more, wouldn't that make what you have even more attractive to a major? Yeah, I think it, I think it, I think it fundamentally, yes. We have posited for quite some time that the exploration potential we see, not just at Van, but at some of these other targets within Descartes, has the potential to, uh, you know, where we have the potential to delineate nickel tonnage to define a multi generational deposit that could ultimately rival a place like Sudbury in terms of how well it's known globally for being a center of global nickel mining. 
And so adding, adding van into the mix and other potential targets that we've, that we've uh, identified over time uh, further enforces that. And for sure, from a major company standpoint, I think the 35 year mine life that's already been delineated at Baptiste is attractive. And if we have the potential to add decades, if not generations on top of that, it's um, it, it becomes an attractive proposition. Absolutely. Martin, for listeners that maybe don't follow the nickel market, can you bring us up to speed in the last, since we haven't spoken in four months, what's been happening in the nickel market that we should be aware of? Yeah. Nickel, like the base metals has continued. Uh, most of the base metals have performed quite well. Um, you just had the wrap up of LME week, which is probably the biggest week in the base metals calendar. Uh, last week in London, this is a conference that happens every year where people from all parts of the supply chain discuss supply demand, and their projections going forward. So the fact that you have that, that conference happening where all the big brains in that market are, are together and you see positive pricing coming out of that, uh, I think is indicates that that is, is, is all the more so the consensus view that that uh, that uh, nickel demand, that demand for base metals continues to be strong and that there's, there's I think, the need fundamentally to start thinking about building the next generation of nickel operations. And that's where we think uh, we come in. In terms of pricing, the nickel price is over $9 a pound right now. Uh, st- still really only scratching the surface, I think, of where the potential is. You have to remember that in the last cycle, the nickel price peaked at $24 a pound. And that was that was when stainless steel was the only kind of name of the game um, uh, in terms of demand. We now have that this new source of demand coming from electric vehicle batteries. So where could the nickel price go in 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 the fullness of time with this brand new source of huge demand? You know that that that's an open question at this point. Uh, as it relates to the automotive companies that need nickel, uh, I lived for 10 years in Dearborn, Michigan, which is the headquarters of Ford Motor Company. And so I purchased a Ford last year. 15,000 miles on it. I always buy used, let somebody else take the depreciation. The car I bought for 27,000, one year old, I could now sell for $45,000 because the market, there's just no supply of new cars. And when I was talking to the dealer, it all goes back to these semiconductors and other parts, he says, that they don't even have to make the vehicles. So I can sell my used vehicle with another 17,000 miles on it for more than almost double what I paid a year ago. And I yeah. said, okay, well, can I buy a new one then? Can I cash that out and buy a new one? He's like, no, I don't even have a car to sell you. So I bring that up in terms of if these manufacturers are going to produce all these electrical vehicles, they need like decades of forethought, don't they, in order to source all of the things like nickel that they need to produce these electrical vehicles? Absolutely. I think the semiconductor shortage is like the canary in the coal mine for the global auto industry. It's really showing them the importance of the supply chain and how existential it is to their business. These companies are used to being able to turning on to turn on the tap and get all the materials they need to produce as many cars as they as they as they want to make. That is fundamentally not the case for electric vehicles. Okay, they had have not yet matured their procurement strategy for how they're going to get all of the cobalt all of the manganese, all of the lithium, and all of the nickel that they're going to need for these cars to you know, electrify the, the North American vehicle fleet over the next you know, several years and decades thereafter. So th- these are groups, without naming names, that we've been talking to, to automakers, to battery makers, and they're making multi-billion dollar investments to build battery plants in the United States to feed into these cars, but they don't have a pure procurement strategy yet as to how they're going to get all those metals. Those procurement strategies are being developed as we speak, and how you know um, how nickel development companies like ourselves fit into that, I think, is going to be a very interesting space to watch. You know, you have the the CEO of Ford recently coming out talking about the need for mines and how you know the auto industry needs to open its eyes to the fact that the supply chains need to go all the way back up to the mines, and I think it's pretty much inevitable. And you're starting to see it with some of the battery makers already that they are going to have to invest upstream in deposits, in mine operations, and also into junior miners to, to uh, secure that supply in the medium and long term, because otherwise they, don't, they won't have a business. So Ford Motor Company could get into mining. Do you see that or do you should just see more of a partnership to where they would bring on a miner to help them develop uh, their source material? Well, the, I won't comment on, on specific companies. I will say that major U.S. automakers are investing upstream in battery plants, right? They are partnering with Asian battery uh, battery specialists 
to build the next generation of battery plants in the United States. So they're making that first upstream step from the vehicles to the batteries themselves. And then the battery plants themselves, I think will, will the, next, the next phase of investment will have to be upstream investment into mining operations in order to secure supply, not just to secure the supply of the metal units, to, sub, to secure them at something like a fixed cost so that they can actually plan their business and oh yeah, they also have a serious need for that material to be coming from North America for ESG reasons and for supply chain security reasons as well. You've talked about how one of the threats to the nickel investing thesis could be too high of prices too quickly to where manufacturers look for a substitution. But if they're going to invest in all of this manufacturing, doesn't that kind of put a damper on that substitution theory if they're going to put everything in place to use nickel to build the ba batteries which will go on the EVs? Yeah, listen, I think the role of nickel in lithium ion phosphate batteries and high nickel content in those batteries is pretty secured for the next 10 to 15 years for sure. Um, um, so that substitution, I don't think is a risk on that kind of time frame. But at the same time, if the, if the uh, car companies and the battery makers want the mining companies to build mines that may have 20, 30, 40 year mine lives, um, you know, they're going to have to give some certainty to the uh, to the upstream part of the market, to the mining companies, that there will be a market for that nickel. And I think that's part and parcel of the mining companies needing to then induce the uh, downstream users, so the automakers and the battery makers, into some type of collaboration so that both sides have protection within that supply chain so that on the one side, the consumers are getting the nickel units that they need. And on the other side, the mining companies are getting that end market certainty that they need in order to be able to plan their business on, on a 15, 20 or 30 year time basis. So if investors are looking at FPX nickel, you got the new discovery, you got the undervaluation argument with just the Baptiste uh, deposit yeah. alone, and the macro situation looks good. Yeah, really all of the macro situation is pointing in the direction for, you know, higher nickel demand, sort of constrained supply of nickel, particularly constrained in places like North America, where there just isn't any kind of um, uh, new nickel mines being built and haven't for, for, for quite some period of time. And at the company level, yeah, listen, we, we, uh, on, on the basis of Baptiste alone, uh, Baptiste generate, generated in the PEA a market capitalization in excess of $2 billion Canadian dollars. We're currently trading at $90 million. So we're trading at a multiple of about you know, 0 0.04, 0 0.05 to our asset value on the basis of Baptiste alone. When you now layer on this discovery of a new potential deposit at Van, one where the, the initial results from holes one and two show that it could be comparable with or even potentially better than Baptiste, you know, um, we, we definitely feel really good about where, where, uh, where the company is going for, from this point forward and, and, you know, definitely think that there's a huge valuation gap uh, here that, that needs to be redressed. You've been listening to Martin Turan. He's the president, CEO, and director of FPX Nickel Corp. Website is fpxnickel.com, ticker symbol in Toronto, FPX, and in the States on the OTC, F-P-O-C-F. Martin, thanks for coming on the show today, and congratulations with this discovery. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill.